for welcome. And I do think it's quite auspicious to have Professor Gaillard here for the first anthropology department. It's just really exciting, this kind of event. And I hope everybody that can will um, come and have dinner and sort of celebrate in general. This is a really exciting um, series, and I can't think of anyone better to start than um, Professor Jane Gaillard because she's done some incredible work. Um, I hope that it, we will have some way of visualizing it. <laughs> but if not, Doing the, technology, we'll, we're, yeah. the technology part um, may be lacking. But um, many of you may be familiar with her work, and I have been very um, moved by her work that was most recently an American ethnologist from which she's going to be talking about today. Um, let me give you a little bit of a biography. It's just really brief. Um, she's a graduate of the LSE and the University of Rochester, and she's been faculty at Harvard, Boston University, Northwestern, and now John Hopkins. Uh, her research in West Africa is focused on two related themes, agricultural production and monetization. And her most recent single authored book, which some of you may have read, is Marginal Gains, Monetary Transactions in Atlantic Africa. And now the paper presented for today, which we'll see if we have it on here, um, is an update of one published in the American Ethnologist. In, I think it's August 2007, and I'm going to be looking at it. And it's quite extraordinary, and it's part of a series that she's working on, all devoted to economic ideologies and predicaments of the present. So on issues about prophecy, which we have today, on hope, confusion, price, cash, all kinds of mentions. Um, Gaillard currently serves on the International Advisory Group to the World Bank and the governments of Chad and Cameroon on the Chad and Cameroon Petroleum Development and Pipeline Project and the Board of Directors of the African Studies Association. And she was elected to the National Academy of Sciences Anthropology Division in 2008. So we're extraordinarily pleased to have her with us today. Thank you so much for coming. Well, thank you so much for advising me and for advising me to talk about this a particular paper, which um, although it's published, uh, it was published a year ago, uh, it has a it has a history and it has an ongoing uh, set of conversations uh, that I'm involved with um, about it. So it's not as if it's a completed piece of work. And so to present it and to have uh, conversations with you all about our ongoing uh, possibilities for researching these kinds of of, um, of, of topics for. Uh, concentrating the anthropological uh, mind and the, our anthropological archive on topics that we haven't, um, on the whole, traditionally studied. Uh, that's really uh, a wonderful thing for, for me, even though, uh, as I say, that in one incarnation this paper is already published. We're not finding it. Uh, take a little while. Um, so, well, so my first, my first PowerPoint, when you find it, yeah, and let me just suggest there are a few seats here and there in the front if you want to come and sit so you don't stand the whole time. Uh, on, on the first uh, PowerPoint when uh, when it comes up. And that is um, a, a brief history of the paper itself because it, uh, it, it started several years ago. It was published last year, but I started thinking along the lines of trying to think about the temporal frames, the temporalities of current economic life. Uh, I really started to think about this about um, 10 years ago when I was in Nigeria. Uh, I... Um, I was, I was working then on the current crises uh, in, in Nigeria. There were various crises, a lot of different kinds of crises. Um, but I became very um, impressed by the fact that a lot of the economic rhetoric was about growth in the long term. It was about how to make the economy grow in the long run. But the idea of the long run uh, was coexisting in people's lives with immediate um, uh, um, problems of access to electricity, to water, to gasoline, to, uh, to food. Um, I was literally in 1997 in, uh, in Nigeria at a moment when uh, for a few days there was no gasoline, no electricity, and no running water. Uh, so the newspapers were announcing that there was a, a, a national commission that was called Vision 2020 
that was meeting in the capital to discuss this growth in the long term. And in the meantime, the newspaper itself with these kinds of headlines was being used by people to try to uh, you know, stuff holes in, in, uh, in, 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 in windy buildings and to wrap things in the market and, and, and so on. Uh, Mop-up paper, in a way. So it, it was that. Uh, incredible dissonance between uh, the immediate situation in which people were living and the rhetoric, the economic rhetoric that was circulating uh, that started this particular line of thought going in my mind. Uh, and I didn't really start working on it until here we are, brief history of this talk. I actually only started to really write it and to, uh, to try to bring together the ideas in about 2004 and then presented it first in 2005. Um, so here, here uh, here's this brief, uh, brief history of this talk. I, I made a presentation, a, a lecture called Between Rationality and Prophecy, where I was trying to bring together the um, rational action frames in which we were thinking about economics with the long-run prophetics uh, that were also in, uh, in, in, in popular economic terminology. Um, uh, so I made a presentation, and then that eventually became this uh, published article, which was part of a forum piece in the American Ethnologist. So there were seven other scholars who commented on it, and I did a rejoinder. Uh, so that created uh, a, a, a sort of intense nexus of conversation. <coughs> uh, so I did a rejoinder in relation to their uh, to, to their responses, and then I have a few new and ongoing observations. Um, and doubtless, this discussion that we'll have here will be just part of an ongoing uh, set of, of, uh, of thoughts that we in anthropology, I think, need to work on together uh, to really sharpen our approaches to uh, the economic cultures of the present and of the world we live in, not just the Nigerias and the New Guineas and the, um, and, 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 and the faraway places, but, but, but at home. And this uh, particular paper uh, is, is focused on, uh, on the at-home location uh, of, uh, of these questions. Um, so uh, one of the really um, challenging issues for us in anthropology is, is it, it really is how to focus these days. There are so many powerful dynamics at once in the world. And they're so diffuse, and they're so interconnected with each other across very large distances, uh, that focusing our minds on specific key issues and then investigating them with the same kind of sophisticated empirical work that we have, uh, that we have done in the past is, is this very large challenge. So this particular paper, uh, I, it took me several years to focus it and to, to, to try to decide exactly where uh, to pick up a thread uh, that would lead me into some interesting em empirical explorations. Um, what, what began to be focused around this question of how do time frames become plausible to people? Why do we think about our lives in one time frame or another? Why, why is that realistic to us? How does it become realistic to us? to think about the long run, or the short run, or the medium term, uh, or seasonal cycles, or, 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 or longer term cycles, like trade cycles. There are a whole series of uh, temporalities that are available for our, um, for our use, for our application. So how do particular ones at particular moments of history with particular populations uh, become so highly persuasive uh, that life seems uniquely, realistically organized in those terms. Right. So, so that was my question, which in some ways is a very classic anthropological question. How do particular cultural concepts or approaches to life become, become <coughs> uniquely persuasive to populations? That's almost a direct quotation from Gitz's definition of religion from like 1972, and we could read back through anthropological history uh, to find uh, that kind of definition of the kind of problem that we're looking at. But this one is, is now. This is, this is in situations of change. Um, so my question was, how, does, how did the long run become a plausible way for us to think about uh, the framing of our economic life? When did that happen? How did it happen? Uh, and so on. Um, I just wanted to um, give you a little um, personal background also, because I think that it's, it's 
um, especially for the students, it's worth saying that many of the topics that we pick on and that we persist with uh, come to us um, as very persuasive because they fit into our own lives in certain sorts of ways. In, in anthropology, we use our own experience uh, to, uh, to, to lend um, motivation to particular topics. Uh, so uh, one of the um, reasons that one of the reasons that this topic of the long run uh, seemed extraordinarily important and exciting to me is, is this. This is my own ration book growing up in Britain in uh, the immediate post-war period. So I went my whole childhood to the store with a ration book as well as money to go to buy everything, more or less everything. This, I, I, I uh, photocopied, it was actually for students for another, another context, personal points, sweets, you see that? <laughs> That's the candy allowance. You couldn't buy candy unless you had your book and they, the grocer took out the little square and you gave them the money and you got only a certain amount of candy, six ounces a week actually. <laughs> Not that you remember. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I grew up uh, under, um, uh, uh, under a certain kind of regulated market system. Um, and by the time I was a student, um, the development frameworks, because uh, I was a student just at the time when uh, many of the countries that had been in the British Empire were gaining uh, independence, their frames of thinking were the five-year plan. How are we going to get from 1960 to 1965? How are we going to get from 1965 to 1970? Uh, so, um, of course, I, when I did economics, which I did as an undergraduate, friend back there. I was just talking about being an undergraduate. Sandy Davis and I were undergraduates together at the London <laughs> School of Economics. Sorry, I'm late. There's a Come sit here. So we took, we, took, we took what was then standard classical, neoclassical economics as, a, as, as undergraduates. You know, Paul Samuelson introduction to economics. Actually, uh, and, and it was, to us, exotic. We didn't, we had never... <laughs> We, we hadn't really lived with this kind of market in quite the same way that we now take it for granted. So uh, you can see then that there's, a, there's in my own life a kind of generational gap, but it's a culture gap, right? That when, when there are certain kinds of new ideas that come to the fore, um, they, they seem particularly exotic to me sometimes because of, uh, of, of this kind of background. Uh, so, what uh, what I was seeing here um, was this this uh, this odd to me very odd emphasis on the very distant future when the immediate seemed to be um, very, very very problematic. Uh, so um, here I just wanted to place this in in, in the context of these papers that uh, Melissa. Uh, referred to here, so I do have a series of papers that are doing the same kind of thing. Uh, these are not their full titles, but they're about um, confusion. How do we recognize confusion? And when we talk about confusion or chaos or uh, so on, how do we recognize that? How do we describe it if we uh, haven't seen criticism? Uh, this one, prophecy. Um, this, one, this one is on Nigeria, on the, on the relationship between divinational religions and what we would think of as hope. Um, this one on intelligibility is to do with how do ordinary populations understand the economies in which they, they live and work. Um, uh, and this one on prices, why, do, why are prices plausible to us, right? <laughs> why, 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 why do we ally price and worth, and how do we do that? Um, and so on, I think I don't need to go through them all. So this is a, this, it's only just very recently that this has occurred to me to be actually a series of, uh, of um, of contemplations of different facets of the same question. That is that we live in a, a novel economic uh, circumstance. Um, how are we as anthropologists to understand the popular understandings of that? Um, we may have to have recourse to the, um, the theoretical armature of uh, the economics discipline, uh, which I think we, we ought to, we need to. But our, our job in life in the great division of the intellectual labor is to try to understand how populations themselves think about uh, the economic world in which they live and in which they have to uh, make a living. You know, what does it mean to make a living uh, under a different, uh, different regimes of, um, of um, 
culture, different regimes of power, uh, different regimes of value. Okay, so then uh, uh, let's go back to this temporal framing. Um, this, um, the long run struck me as an, an anomalous idea, um, or, or at least an intriguing idea. Also because, uh, as many of you probably know, our recent um, thinking in anthropology about the temporal frames of what is sometimes depicted as postmodernism or postmodernity has very much emphasized uh, the present simulta simultaneity, um, eruption, violent intervention, the event, um, the, the immediate. Right? Uh, and even to a degree that, um, uh, that uh, Frederick Jameson has written, for example, that, that we're no longer thinking in really temporal terms. He, he talked about the end of temporality. Uh, we, we have also a thinking about the past, or at least a critique of the thinking about the past, that uh, focuses not so much on long dynamics and long processes and the unfolding of things, but on origins, what's the beginning? And then we sort of elide all of the intervening stages. So uh, I, I, I felt quite um, skeptical about this particular view. I thought that it wasn't only a question of, of uh, simultaneity, but there was this large question of what is the long run and how does the long run figure uh, in, um, in our, our modes of thinking about the world that we live in. Um, so um, I looked in, in, um, in two places. So I looked, I looked in the economic theory. Where did the concept of the long run come from? Um, how has it been brought forward over time? And then I looked in religion. So hence, I, I fit into your category of, of religions, economies, and the title of your series here, right? So I thought that the, 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 uh, the longest, oldest ways of thinking about time come from our religious lives. They don't come from uh, um, politics and economics on the whole. So to look into uh, the religious um, the religious resonances of the kind of, of vision of the long run uh, that was um, uh, coming out of the economic theory. And um, as the title suggests, I was thinking about this thinning of attention, thinning of theoretical attention, or even allusion to what I call the near future. So somewhere between the immediate and the long run, there was a, a temporal frame that I felt that I'd grown up with, the five-year plan, what are we, how are we going to uh, you know, create a, a particular, or get to a particular benchmark of growth and so on, uh, that, was a, that had become very um, sparse in its presence in our intellectual and cultural lives. So um, let's, go, let's move forward to where the face of the long run. So the long run is not, in, is, is, of course, is an old idea in, in economics. It's, a, it's quite a quite an old idea. Uh, it goes back into the 19th century. Um, so this, um, I've just put onto one slide. I should have had them come up one after the other, these different uh, visions of the long run. But we just start with, uh, with Marshall, uh, who is one of the great thinkers in the, um, in the creation of modern neoclassical economics, who moved away from uh, the notion that value was based in um, in, um, in land or labor or something tangible into the notion of value as, as created uh, uh, through demand and supply in markets. And he put into the lexicon in a major way uh, the notion that there was a difference between the analysis of the long run and the analysis of the short run. And indeed, the dynamics of the long run uh, and the dynamics of, 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 the, of the short run. Uh, let me just read you a little bit from 1890. Okay, so thus we may conclude uh, this is in uh, his Principles of Economics. Thus we may conclude that as a general rule, the shorter the period which we are considering, the greater must be the share of our attention which is given to the influence of demand on value because people can't change the factors of production. So price fluctuations uh, will uh, result from fluctuations in, uh, in demand in the short run. Okay. And the longer period, we'll differentiate this from the longer period, um, um, over which the more important will be the influence of the cost of production on value, because uh, producers can change the factors of production uh, and 
um, and respond to demand uh, by shifting the, uh, the conditions uh, under which that they put that product uh, onto the market. Uh, so he, um, uh, so he, he comes to this kind of conclusion. The actual value at any time, the market value, as it's often called, is often more influenced by passing events and by causes whose action is fitful and short-lived than by those which work persistently. But in long periods, these fitful and irregular causes in large measure efface one another's influence, so that in the long run, persistent causes dominate value completely. So he was trying to think about how uh, we can look at uh, these persistent causes, we can, we can uh, elucidate, we can, we can analyze out the persistent causes from uh, the causes uh, that, that cause fluctuations over, these, uh, over the short run. So he was not himself not, um, as I understand, I'm not an economic historian, but he was not altogether clear on um, how one would identify the persistent causes given historical change. Right? The, um, there's a certain assumption of uh, the conditions, the only conditions that are changing are the conditions of demand or the conditions of supply, but of course, wars happen and changes of government and so on. So how to actually see that long run um, outside of history was, uh, was a problem that he recognized but uh, didn't necessarily uh, um, resolve. And this uh, is, in a, uh, is always attributed to John Maynard Keynes who was um, dealing in much of his uh, of his um, his intellectual life, he was dealing with the economic consequences of the Great War. So, it's a, a very famous and important piece of work uh, from around 1920, and then dealing with the Depression, and then dealing with the creation of the Bretton Woods institutions in the 1940s. So he was dealing with uh, with precisely the kind of historical forces uh, that Marshall was trying to. Um, to try to put in the background so that he could analyze out these persistent causes in the long run. And so he put really on the back burner this idea of the long run. And he suggested to us, right, you know, in the long run we're all dead, which is uh, famously uh, attributed to him. And in fact, um, I, I think I put into the paper, um, there's a, a probably also an apocryphal attribution to him that, that, um, that the studies, he said, here at Cambridge, we leave the studies of the long run to the undergraduates. <laughs> this, is, this is a sort of, so hypothetical in the world in which I live. War, depression, war, uh, that um, we can put that one away for, 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 for the future, for future generations to try to figure out how we're going to think about the long run. Uh, so then, However, this ver the very important thinking of Friedrich von Hayek in um, uh, 1944, um, who was looking with, with um, um, an in intense um, uh, dismay at the centralization of the state in Europe under not only uh, fascism and national socialism and eventually um, communism, but even in in the uh, democratic, um, social democratic kinds of, of, um, of regimes, the economy, control of the economy was centralized during war. And he was, he was totally opposed to that. He thought this is, this is not the way that we should be going into the future after, uh, after World War II, and was rising to try to, to figure out, to open, in fact, a new field where the, the fluctuations price fluctuations and the challenges that, uh, that uh, Keynes and um, his colleagues were trying to address, um, trying to address those in a, with a different mechanism, namely with monetary policy. He was trying to develop a new branch of economics where, of uh, macroeconomics, where uh, the control of the money supply by the state would be their prime function and that everything else would be left largely to the market. So it was, he was trying to liberate um, what he saw as, as um, intensely and dangerously over-regulated um, um, economies. He's trying to open them up uh, to markets. Uh, so this um, the Road to Serfdom, this book is called The Road to Serfdom, and it bears, absolutely bears uh, restudy 
uh, in the present. Um, it's poetic in places, uh, intensely poetic. If in the long run we are makers of our own fate, in the short run we are captive of the ideas we have created. We need to be very humble about the uh, extrapolations from our own rationalities and our own experience, our own short and near-term sense of knowing how markets and economies work. So we have, with uh, Friedrich von Hayek, uh, uh, again, a, a, a much greater emphasis on the importance of the, uh, the analysis and the understanding of the long run and the limitation of states' uh, sense that they could control, uh, they could control many of the uh, framing uh, um, conditions of national economies. Then we get into the kind of development era, Walt Rostow famous uh, um, stages of economic growth, where he's 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 arguing, yes, we are we are trying to create economic growth, but he's very um, skeptical uh, about the separation of the analysis of the long and the short run. He's saying we this is this is unwise. He uses the, the, the he calls it it's a failing of wisdom. Uh, not necessarily a failing of analysis, you know, I'm going to say a failing, intellectual failing, but it's not wise uh, to throw all of our, our eggs into this one basket of monetary policy and, and to not try to deal with what's going on in the short run. Or to assume that what's going on in the short run is necessarily going to uh, be a good thing in the long run. It's necessarily going to accumulate to, uh, to growth. So, um, so I was very um, intrigued and interested uh, by uh, uh, by the ways in which this, these ideas of the long run, the temporality of the long, long run, had such a fluctuating uh, history uh, in uh, in economic theory. The um, the idea um, gains much more currency again somewhere around 1980. Um, the the post-war period is much more influenced by Keynes and the Rostow kinds of, 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 of thinkers, uh, but uh, by about 1980, and I think that many of us, are, uh, let me finish the sentence and then go on to the parenthesis, um, that uh, by 1980 there had been an enormous amount of new work in economics on monetarism and how to, uh, how to uh, study the money supply, how to track the money supply, how to uh, how to build scenarios, future scenarios, and especially, of course, with computer technology. So the whole uh, the whole possibility of doing kind of uh, uh, virtual experimentations with um, with um, uh, um, variables such as the money supply becomes much more possible as the, as uh, as we get into uh, the, uh, the the digital era. Uh, this is this is very important. Um, the uh, uh, the parenthesis that I was going to put in there is that, that quite often this theoretical development, which is Milton Friedman, which I, I'm sure many of you study uh, in economics classes, um, for those who are very critical of it, they, they they tend, in my own view, they tend not to appreciate the uh, the the depth of the scholarship that went, that has gone into developing. Uh, monetarist approaches. We may, we may have reservations about the implications uh, of, 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 of that theory as it plays out, and particularly as it plays out politically, uh, but there is no doubt that it's a very sophisticated theory, just as I'm going to suggest to you that the religious theory that somehow got tra tracks it uh, is also very sophisticated. What did I include next here? Okay, so I, I included some definitions. Okay, this, uh, this is from the New Palgrave, which is the dictionary of, of, e of economics. So monetarism is the view that quantity of money has a major influence on economic activity through the judicious in intervention of the central bank. So hence, you know, the rise of the very important figures like Greenspan. Right? Uh, the demand function for monetary assets is claimed to be stable. Right? So monetarists put, put, and I put in red these long, the long run, the V. The, the, the revival of the importance of the long run. Monetarist thought puts primary emphasis on the long run consequences of policy actions and procedures. It rejects attempts to reduce these short run fluctuations 
uh, in interest rates and economic activity as generally inimical to the otherwise achievable goals of long-run price stability and maximum economic growth. So that's, that's from 1989, that was, this was uh, 1989 edition, edition of the new power grade. Uh, this then is the re-instantiation of, of the long run. So what was supposed to happen in the short run? Um, this is a rather bad, rather bad, bad slide, but I, did, I, I, I found a, a small quotation for you, but you can find this in a lot of, uh, in, in a lot of publications um, in this tradition of thought. Uh, let's just go down to here, because no one knows which venture will succeed, right? which number will win the lottery, a society ruled by risk and freedom rather than by rational calculus, a society open to the future rather than planning it, can call forth an endless stream of invention, enterprise, and art. So this was what was to move into this near future, was endless invention, was to be space, uh, a space for invention. right? Um, not rational calculation, not the five-year plan, not that kind of, um, of, um, of uh, benchmarking of the future, but, um, but a, a space of freedom. Milton Friedman's uh, famous uh, book on freedom would fit exactly with this, uh, with this philosophy. So this was the, the uh, an approach that, um, that combined uh, the vision of the long run with an expectation that people would be highly inventive in this mid midterm temporal frame uh, that um, that I call the near future, I and mean, in which I thought that I had been brought up. Right? This was a different terrain now. Uh, it was being framed in a different way uh, than I had remembered. Okay, so um, let me uh, let, let me go uh, go forward then to uh, the, the part of this paper, which is about religion. Uh, so I was asking myself, well, how does this become plausible to ordinary people? These are very esoteric um, theories in their intellectual instantiation. How are people to us uh, to take on this, this shifting of our temporal frames into, uh, into, this, uh, this, this distant, um, into this distant frame? Um, why? Why, what do we do? Do we just follow this this <laughs> this roller coaster of it? let's look at the short run, let's look at the midterm, let's look at the long run? And we, do we just is that just not particularly meaningful to us? We're just following. So I felt that you know we need um, as anthropologists we need to imagine that this is meaningful to people. So in what sense? What? How? How does it become um, a, a thinkable idea of, around which to live our ordinary lives? Like, Political lies we'll put aside. That I looked at in a different paper. What, how do, what does this do to our relationships with government, for example? If the only thing government is doing is, or the main thing that government is doing is manipulating the money supply, what am I able to ask my government to do for me economically? Right? That's a, it's a separate question. We can talk about it later. But these were the questions that I was trying to try to look at. And so I did look at to religion. I thought, well, okay. So uh, the idea of prophecy moves back and forth across these two literatures. Let's just look at prophecy. You know, what sorts of prophecy do we have in religious life at around the same time? So 1980, 1982 uh, to then uh, 2000. Um, and the most elaborately developed by far of, um, of theories of temporality um, for that period is in the Protestant evangelical tradition. And again, this is very so sophisticated thinking as we'll see in a minute. So this, uh, I thought maybe if you would want to, I would show you this, where this comes from. <coughs> so there's a, an entire book on the temporal frames, this entire book on the temporal frames of, of evangelical Christianity, and a big chart that shows you where, you know, where we all are, right? So the, uh, this, the, these, um, these uh, PowerPoints are all taken from this book. So uh, Tim LaHaye and Thomas Ice. So what am I, what am I going to point out here, or what am I going to find here? I, I was I was I was riveted by this book. I thought this was incredibly interesting. So in this, there's a whole you know there's the beginning of time back here, creation and so on and so forth. But we are in this period here, right? between 
between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming. So this is the temporal frame in which we live. So whereabouts in that do we live? How does it, how, how, how does it configure to us? So I don't know whether you, many of you perhaps are familiar with the notion of dispensational time. I, I don't know if, or if this is a completely new idea. Dispensational time? The uh, evangelical theories of time are that there, there, there are dispensations that are, um, that are characteristic. <coughs> Each dispensation, which is a historical period, um, is, differs from the others in that the divine presence in the world differs from one period to the next. So what does this mean? That this means that there are no general theories of human life from beginning to end. Right? The, the theories of time and of our being and of our potential will differ according to the dispensation, the particular way in which the divine is present in the world. So this, this is a, this is a, a series of, of, of the dispensations, and I think you can't quite see here, but it's very, very closely tracked into the scriptures. You know, like, um, references under every single uh, uh, category. So responsibility, this is your responsibility in the dispensation that's called innocence. This is your failure, the failures that are characteristic of that dispensation. And this is the judgment, the kind of judgment that, that the divine presence will, will meet out on the world in that dispensation. So uh, this is why, um, well, this is one intellectual reason why uh, the evangelical movement is inimical to the theory of evolution. Because the theory of evolution is a uniformitarian theory of time, that the same processes are going on all the time, that the evolutionary processes are uh, the processes are uniform right throughout time. Uh, and this is fundamentally not their view of the passage of time uh, in its religious framing. So again, uh, we, we are here in the church age. Yeah. So the question that I looked into then was, well, well what, what is the characteristic of time in that dispensation? Let's just put all the others aside in the, in the back of our minds and look at that. So here, this the church age, which is from the, from the, actually from the first coming to the second coming, right, is the age of the church. So what goes on during during this age? Well, you have continual growth. You know, again, I was I was trying to track the terminologies. We had economic growth as the justification for the long run, right? Um, so we have continual growth of the church, but increasing apostasy. So. Uh, there's a there's a, a struggle view of what of what is going on in uh, in this period. So uh, rather than go into great detail about this the whole framework, let me just point out one crucial thing that I'm just going to track into the next into the next section of the talk, and that is that we don't know when this ends. We don't know how long it is. That we are in a dispensation, a temporal dispensation, which is ongoing. But we have we have no sense of its. We know that it's going to be superseded by another, but we don't know when. Um, we do we do to some degree know how, but we certainly don't know when. So, um, if you look at this one, um, another there are, there are several different ways of expressing this. But um, you see here, there's the first coming and the second coming is over here. But you see every single era. Has a, temp has a specific number of years associated with it. Okay. So, so this is 374, 70, 586, 7,000 years, this millennium. But this has no t time frame to it. We don't know how long this is going to be. It's already, uh, it's already 2,000, almost 2,000 years, but it could be 4,000 years, it could be 2001. Um, it's, uh, it's very open-ended. Um, so what is the what is it to live in this dispensation? What sort of, uh, of, 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 uh, of time framing is this? I think I'm going a bit too slowly, aren't I? Uh, let, uh, so let me just go uh, um, very briefly to, uh, to some of the scriptural bases. Since this is, I think this is in the title of your, of your series here, is to draw out the, uh, the religious implications. Um, let me, um, let me 
let me see. I've got two points that I want to bring out of this. Uh, one is um, the, the scriptural study that goes into this is very precise and very thoughtful. Um, there are very specific passages uh, that undergird very particular, um, uh, particular inferences. Um, the, um, this, uh, um, this um, space here is, is referred, for those of you who go back and look at, at your Bibles, is, is referred back textually to, uh, to a gap between D Daniel 9.26 and Daniel 9.27. That there's a there's a lapse of logic in the in the um, prophetic scriptures at that point uh, that is not is not filled in with any kind of logic um, that uh, Daniel nine twenty six ends on desolations that the the desolation of the people of the people of Israel right? and, and nine twenty seven begins and he shall confirm the covenant with many. So what exactly happened between the desolation and the reinstatement of the covenant is not in the, in the scriptures, right? So the thought, uh, the, 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 imagine, the religious imagination moves into that space uh, and suggests that there is, uh, there, there is a, a whole process there. So what, what, so what sort of process? So the second thing that I want to draw, draw out from here um, is um, is this apostasy that goes on? Let's just go back. So what is what is, what is that about apostasy? Well, it's 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 very interesting when you read through the uh, through the uh, religious thought here um, that um, it's associated. Apostasy is associated um, with um, following one's own rationality, right? having one's own reasons. Working from one's own uh, calculations about the world, not uh, living in the light of the dispensational um, dynamic. Okay. Uh, and there's a very uh, specific passage again. If you want to look it up, uh, I'll find it. it's in uh, the second epistle of Peter, chapter three, starting at verse three. If you are interested to look it up. Uh, and it says, there shall come in the last days scoffers, saying, where is the promise of his coming, the second coming? All things continue as they are. For this they willingly are ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So the idea that we impose our own temporalities, that we impose our own reasons, uh, that we that we think through those kind of plans is, uh, is associated negatively with this apostasy. That we are to be thinking of ourselves as part of something uh, very much larger that is, ha has a, an, um, an end point that we can't predict. It's, it's, in, it's in the future, it's in the long run. So again, so the thing that I was looking at here was this, this, this um, uh, I, I called it the evacuation, but it's, I think it, People have criticized me for that. The evacuation of the near future. But that's what I said in the paper. But I think that the, uh, that critique is a good one. It's the kind of thinning out and the downgrading of attention to these fluctuations in the near and the midterm. Right? That they are not important. We shouldn't be focusing on them. We certainly don't, shouldn't think we're mastering them. We should be submitting to them in the interest uh, of, the, uh, of the direction uh, that life is going uh, in the long run. Uh, and indeed, you can find parts of, um, of uh, von Hayek that are, uh, are, are quite similar. You know, as I was suggesting, there's a poetic nature to that, uh, to that book. For example, he says, it is man's submission to the impersonal forces of the market that in the past made possible the growth of a civilization. It is by thus submitting that we are every day helping to build something which is greater than any one of us can fully comprehend. And it is infinitely more difficult, rationally, to comprehend the necessity of submitting to forces whose operation we cannot follow in detail than to do so out of the humble awe which religion or even the respect for doctrines of economics did inspire. So he's, he, he also is suggesting to us that 
just trying to master in the short run is it's almost analogous to this kind of uh, scoffing of thinking that one could actually master one's own, uh, one's own fit. Okay, so where are I going next? Um, all right, well, <laughs> up to the present. Um, <laughs> so in the, in the paper, I went on to say, well, what do we do with the near future? And the near future is here, the near future is part of life. So in the paper, I was just saying we, uh, the, 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 the aspect of public economic culture that strikes me, again, I'm, I'm, I'm saying it's a hunch, right? Is that we have a lot of punctuated time, we have a lot of dates, we are doing things by dates, we are, uh, the, the, uh, we are encouraged to think in terms of particular contractual limits or particular, uh, um, say the, the um, beginning and end of, of certain kinds of, uh, of interventions, we, 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 we have much more uh, kinds of uh, collective investment in a date kind of mastery of the near term, than at least than I remember. So this is not actually done by us individually as rationally scoffing at the, the notion that we're going somewhere very good in the long term. Uh, it's done collectively by uh, our institutions, our banking institutions, and our, um, our, uh, our uh, insurance institutions, our education institutions setting for us the three-year limits and five-year limits. and and interest rates by certain amounts of time and so on. So I began to think in terms of, of punctuated time. Um, so I just wanted to end with this. I've been collecting, as you can imagine, over this whole, the, actually I started to collect a long time ago, the uh, newspaper headings that seem to speak to me about these kinds of, uh, these, these kinds of concerns. So, uh, so this one, I just put a few. We've reached a post-Keynes, post freedom post consensus, that is we are, we're putting both of these uh, views behind us, David Brooks, right? It, in normal times, the free market works well, but in a crisis like this one, few are willing to sit back and let the market find some equilibrium. Um, so, you know, we have in this saying, like, um, or this, this, this passage, um, a faith in the market, of course, a faith that is, is like the monetary faith. But we have also uh, something coming forward that is not quite um, as um, marked in our in the earlier sources, and that is the notion of normality. What is a normal market? You know, the, a normal market does what? Right? Um, I would have to go back and again and reread um, von Hayek and, and back through time to try and figure out what is a, what are the fluctuations that are normal. I mean, what do we mean by normality? Going back through this uh, theor the theoretical um, tradition. Um, and what would be abnormal, right? Um, so we have we have here the beginnings of a, of a contrast between normality and crisis, right, with respect to this punctuated time in which we live. And President Bush, you know, these are not normal times. I'm just really beginning to collect up <laughs> from stacks of headlines. These are not normal times. The market is not working properly. See, so there's a notion of what's proper what's proper and what's not proper, right? Uh, which we would certainly, um, as, uh, as anthropologists working on whatever, we would be pulling out these words and saying, what, is the, what do they refer to? How do they resonate for people? What do, what do people understand by those words when they're repeated in this sort of way? So my final, my final slide is, uh, is a message that came to me email the day before yesterday from um, the CEO of TIA CREF, which is our oh, our pension fund as as, uh, as teachers, <laughs> as academics, and you will see. <laughs> yeah. Nobody can predict how the near future will happen. So the near future, of course, is the title of my paper. What happened to the near future? Um, well, maybe the near future is going to come back in a really different sort of a way. As a concept, I, I mean as a cultural concept, I, 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 we can trace it back into the analytics of economics. And I, of course, I'm not an economist, so I don't know exactly how that's done. But I, so I'm talking here about our popular understanding of where we, where we are, how we see uh, forward into uh, the futures in which we uh, construct our lives. Thank you. Do you want to take
some questions or no, some absolutely. water? Because, because, I mean, any, anything you have to say is really helpful to me. If you want to look at this in the meantime, the chart or the book or whatever, I could send it around. I have two questions, which I am not sure if they're related or not. But one, I, I wanted to ask you about, um, you, you were tracking in the language of economics and the, and the sort of evangelical yeah. mindset, different ways of thinking about time. But I was wondering whether there, in your sort of readings in e e an evangelical world, is there an evangelical theory of economics? Like do are people talking specifically? I saw I saw very clearly the time connection, but I was just wondering whether there is an evangelical or e multiple evangelical theories of economics. Mm -hmm. So I, I think for sure that there are multiple theories, and I, I I hesitate to really to talk about them because I'm not very deeply read in them. But the, the um, one of the very big differences, um, as I understand it, is between those who um, who take on the notion. Um, Guardianship. I think guardianship of the of the world. But there's a um, there's a, um, there's there's a as it were a, a God given task to be guardians of the world, which they take from Genesis. And so the the care of that world then does something very different with respect to both time and activity. Then um, then focusing on, um, on the orientation to a redemptive future. And I think, um, so you know, this, this I, I, I have to say that I don't know it in, in detail, but there are um, uh, you know, systems of banking, systems of savings, and so on. Um, you, uh, if you go to Amazon, you can look at this, um, really a lot of books about how to stay out of debt that are in the evangelical, um, uh, from evangelical publishers. And there seems to be also, a, at least among, and it's, this is not a field that I'm actually in, but a language of, you know, of becoming wealthy through Well, faith and that's, and, yes, you know. well, so that, that comes from a, also from a particular, oh dear, it was a, it was a book that was sold in a, in a lot of um, airports, right? It was about a particular passage in the Bible that, that you, we would be rewarded from. <coughs> it's from. It's from the Hebrew Bible, it's not from the New Testament, but we would be rewarded uh, for, um, for goodness by by becoming wealthy. So there was, there was a, an emphasis on wealth as a kind of a, a proof of proof of worth. Mm -hmm. So I do think that there is variability here. Uh, I was going to say, I was mentioning to Melissa, and, and, and I might just say it here, is that um, one of the quite moving responses to this paper when it was published was from an evangelical missionary from <laughs> Sudan, who wrote and said, this is, uh, this is, this shift is so right. He said, it's such a shame. You know, our leadership has decided to move uh, the funding and the effort away from the care, the guardianship of people, the medical aspects of their work, towards, um, towards the redemptive orientation of bringing people into the church in time for what some see as a fairly imminent you know, apocalyptic moment. So I think that variability can be either even within you know very particular churches, not only between between them. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious as we were talking earlier about sort of field work and sort of where actually one does the empirical study. I mean, um, where one comes the sort of issue of empirical study and field work. This is very just you know looking at the discourse on the one hand and sort of. How does one imagine actually looking at sort of how these the near an anthropology or an ethnography of the near future? What might that constitute? Where are the spaces or places, if possible? Where do you see that sort of if you had to ask for a trajectory to do empirical work? Yeah. So so, so particularly with students who are doing you know taking classes on field work or right. introduction to just learning we did Malinowski <laughs> this past yeah. week and so where does it how does it, how, where do you see that dimension for yourself and and well, I have a very specific thing that I would like to do, and, uh -huh. and in which this might might fit. That comes between this paper and the one on divination, um, because I, I I'll continue to work on West Africa. Right? I, I I haven't envisaged doing field work here. I'm, I might I might need to rise to the challenge, but I haven't I haven't done that yet. Um, but. Um, 
if you look at the divinatory traditions of West Africa, the, uh, people were, were um, encouraged and enjoined to, uh, to um, consult the diviner very often, like every three or four days, to see, am I on the right track? Am I doing the right thing? Am I making the right deal? Am I going in the truck? Should I go on this trip? Should I stay home? You know, not just the big issues of life, like should I marry this person? Shall I live in this town? And so on, but really a lot of ordinary decisions. Um, take, take them to the diviner. Uh, so um, I'm very interested to, to think about how West African businessmen organize the temporalities of their deals. <laughs> like, because they, they are, in fact, um, uh, doing very large business. It's, it's, you know, we call it the informal sector, but in fact, you know, people are doing hundreds of thousand dollars worth of business between Nigeria and China, you know, like carpets, textiles, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so they make contracts, they sign contracts. It's all kind of un under the formal radar screens. But exactly how those temporalities are worked, how people imagine, I'm going to, I'm going to give a, a down payment. That down payment is going to come back when it's come. You know, the, the, there must be a management of time there uh, that I think. <coughs> would be incredibly interesting to look at and whether it fits and how it might fit with um, the religious temporalities from the past, but also a, a lot of Nigerians are evangelicals, right? So how, how those imaginations about time f map in, into and track the commercial ones, I, th I think yeah. would be really fascinating. I have a question that follows up on that to get you to talk a little bit more about your your discussion of divination and hope. And it partly comes from an upsurgence in Korea, for instance, of appeal to diviners, shamans, by businessmen because of the uncertainties of the markets. And so it's as if they're trying to get an edge, an extra kind of way into seeing the future and into getting some stability in a terribly unstable world. And so I'd, I'd love to know more about your thoughts about this, this correlation, divination, and hope from your own field work in West Africa. Well, the, uh, that hope divination uh, connection I, I, I made through some older field work. The, the present is, an, is another new thing, and I think you're right, that this is on the rise, uh, you know, probably worldwide, um, the recourse to um, some kind of connection to um, to the other forces in the world, the occult or the divine or whatever, in terms of, of people's business enterprise, particularly in this large-scale informal sector, or what we call the informal sector. Um, the thing that I had been doing with that idea of hope was that in an earlier moment of history, uh, there was a lot of literature about West Africa saying that these people are remarkably resilient. Everything is going wrong all the time. Um, you know, like no water, no electricity. <laughs> Um, terrible economic policy and so on and so forth, uh, but they seem to be coming back all the time. And uh, Nigeria, I think you probably know this, Nigeria and Mexico are somewhere at the top of the, you know, when they do studies of which are the happiest places in the world, <laughs> happiest countries in the world, we are way down. Mexico, I think, comes out top all the time. Uh, but Nigeria is way up, which is really counter counterintuitive when you thinking about the kind of lives that people lead. So I was trying to think about, well, what, you know, are, are, is there some way that we can understand this famous resilience, which is people have had recourse to the explanation of resilience you know, for decades about why things don't completely go to, to pieces in, uh, in West Africa. So, so it, was that, it was that connection that I was like, well, what do people, how do people get from A to B? You know, we tend to think, well, why do you get up in the morning and start to work? You know, we have a sort of daily vision of this, I think, uh, ourselves. I mean, if we, if we have to think about our own lives. I mean, why do we get up and, and try again, right? Is that a daily exercise or, or, or you know, what is that? Whereas it, it, when I thought about and I consulted the, all of the literature on divination, it, it, was a, it was a three to four day rhythm. That, so you, you consulted to get yourself in track. And then you did it again three or four days later. So you were supposed to be able to last for three to four days on this advice. But that's you know that that's um, that's quite quite frequent. And that's, so the, the buoying quality of that um, 
that kind of religious discipline, you know, is, is, is what I was trying to try to get at. But then I think that, that we could look, uh, those of us who work in the in, in, more in economics than in, in religion, we could look at the, the literature on religious disciplines and, and try to think them through in terms of some of these questions. Yeah. Yes. Hey, I'm sorry I came late because I know Jane for a long time and I think it's excellent. The question I'd like to ask though, Jane, is this. It's very interesting that in the 1970s and 80s, it became clear that in looking at economic development, we had to look at the environmental side of it with sustainable development. And looking at environment meant that looking at biodiversity and also the sacredness of the earth, the whole idea. And that's where religion became very, very important in protecting the sacredness of the earth. We're seeing that today with climate change. Uh, Al Gore has talked about that here at our National Museum of the American Indian, that we've got to take Mother Earth into account to deal with climate change. But I'll tell you an example that I had of what went on in Guatemala. In Guatemala, when the Catholics did a lot of the Catholic Church, did a lot of the uh, uh, conversion of the Mayan Indians, uh, they let the Indians put crosses on the mountains to say it was sacred to have the, uh, the uh, forests. And that, so they put crosses all over the mountains and they prayed in the mountains to protect. And I remember the priests would go on that. But then there was a war in Guatemala and many of those priests left and evangelicals came in to many of these Mayan communities. And one of the things that they did was get said, don't keep any crosses in the mountains. Put them inside the churches. Don't put them on the mountains. Uh, and they didn't deal with the sacred earth, uh, the evangelicals. Uh, and what happened was forestry got much, much worse throughout Guatemala. Now, I don't know if that's true in other places with religions, but I guess the question I'm asking is perhaps maybe the major issue between different religions and with poor populations has to do with sustainable development and how many really look at the sacredness that these people bring to the earth and are willing to promote the sacredness of the earth with these people. And is that the case in Africa? Do the evangelical churches promote the sacredness? And will they deal with climate change? by taking into account the environment. I, I, I have to say that, um, especially on religion, on which I'm not a scholar, I'm, I, I mean, I study, but I'm very aware that I'm not primarily a scholar of religion, that uh, on these kinds of variabilities within the evangelical movement, I, I really have to say that I, I don't know, except for, um, you know, here it helps me anyway to think about the logic. You know, the, if you know, I haven't talked at all about the idea of the apocalypse or Armageddon or the, the end of times, right? Which does figure in very strongly in some evangelical imagination. So the question of, of what of what one does between now and then, if you think it's near, <coughs> if you think it's coming, right, um, is a question. is an empirical question for us to pay a lot of attention to. Do these variants of, of, the, of, of, of all of the religious traditions, not just the evangelicals, but do they differ very strongly in their view of when that second coming is likely to happen? Because the, the closer it is, when we ask ourselves, they, we would ask them empirically, does that have implications for what you think about as, uh, as, uh, as, a, as activities from now until then. Uh, so I didn't, you know, I didn't address that in, in this paper because I really felt that that whole topic of when is the apocalypse and what is it and so on is just, is just too huge and too, um, I, I felt that I had to be respectful of my own ignorance of, of how different congregations are, are thinking that through. Um, but it's for us, I mean, the, the, those of us who either you know, are religious in other traditions or, or not, not so profoundly guided uh, in every <coughs> breath we take by our religious views, um, we do have to start thinking, uh, we have been encouraged to start thinking, well, uh, the, the time horizons for, for climate change are within 
And they've come, mm. they've come back to me almost within my, my lifetime now. I mean, it used to be 2050, now it's 2020. Mm. We're thinking that there may be a tipping point with respect to climate change. That's hopefully, you know, if I, if I live the, uh, you know, the projected female, you know, actuarial statistic, I'll still be here. Uh, and certainly my children and grandchildren, even if it's 2050, you know, who are already here in the world, will, will be here. What then, I mean, that, that, that notion of there being a, a definitive horizon is an is extremely challenging one for, for, for all of us. What do we do in the meantime? Yeah, well, I guess the question I'm, I'm saying is, in the Old Testament it says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the question I'm asking is, how much is the sacredness of the earth taken into account by the missionaries? How much will they support the local people on this sacredness of the earth? If they're not going to do that, which is so much, then they're not going to be able to deal with economic, sustainable economic development. And they're not going to be able to take into account the local peoples who do believe uh, in the sacredness of the earth. Yeah. So that's the most religious thing well, so, it, from the economic point of view of, so the, we, of, of local tribal and indigenous people is the fact that they look at the earth as being sacred. And many of the people that are promoting development do not look at the earth as sacred, mm -hmm. even though their religions say they should look at it as sacred. No, I, I was just going to say that I mean, that would be a very interesting new trajectory to pursue is, to, is in, in various images of the sacredness of the earth, what kinds of temporal uh, trajectories and cycles do we have? Because the Maya, is, which you know, of course, in detail, is, is one of the most complex of temporal calendrics, isn't it? I mean, the cycles that are like 284 years or so. I mean, very um, long-term thinking, and I, I actually think that calendars, in our very classic anthropology, you know, what do we know about the peoples of the world kind of anthropology, that the calendrics was always thought of as an esoteric little, you know, like numismatics or something, you know, it's like off there, a few, few people did that, but to try to understand calendrics in relation to divinity amongst, as you say, the indigenous peoples of the world would be an incredibly worthwhile endeavor. Tribal. Yes. Yeah. Um, I really liked um, when you opened the talk, you, you, you spoke about how anthropologists can be pulled to examine very large forces that seem very immediate, and it's hard to sort of pick one and then to use our sort of toolkit mm -hmm. as empiricists right. um, and try to make those connections. And I was really, I, re I thought of Sally Falk Moore's article in AE in the 1980s an anthropology of the present, and she talks about how do you see change in the making, which is really how you're ending this. And and I have a, a question for you. Um, even though you said you, you don't see yourself looking at things in the US, you said you've collected all these clips. And this is spectacular change in the making. And I'm wondering, um, because you really theorized beautifully today, this this strange gap, this this weird netherland that anthropologists work in, between a theoretical idea and um, you know boots on the ground, and I'm wondering, what are you doing with these articles? How do you, how are you? Because of course you're thinking about how these markets um, are affecting real lives, and in Africa, the the the, the obvious example is Zimbabwe, yes. right? Um, so how do you talk about this as an anthropologist? And do you think it's too soon, when there is change in the making in that sense, to really sit down and write? Do you think it's a time for collecting articles and thinking? I think, you know, ideally, it's, I think it, uh, it's a moment for real concentration and collective concentration, you know, with, with our colleagues. Um, Collecting, yes, we can do that collecting, right? But what does it what does it mean? What are we really focused on? Because, you know, I, I I tell you because I think of this paper as part of a long, you know, a long, almost stream of consciousness. That there were there was one, there were one or two people in um, in the forum, and one of my colleagues who said to me, Jane, you can't do this. This is just a hunch, right? You base this whole thing on a hunch. 
right? It does, it's not grounded in, it doesn't derive from the theoretical debate, which it doesn't, right? Um, so um, I think that there's a moment now when um, we should, I should be really looking very carefully at well, what, it, what, what are the bases of these hunches that we all have? I mean, all of us have various senses that there's some very um, kind of disruptive or emergent phenomena in the present world. And we have different kinds of identifications of what they are, but uh, we need to concentrate and develop. I think that we need to develop some new uh, theoretical and conceptual tools out of those hunches, like, like uh, delve into them, like why? Why is that a hunch? It's not just personal idiosyncrasy or temperamental something or other. It's probably to do with, the, you know, having spent decades of reading and thinking and teaching, right? But where does it come from and why is it, uh, why is that recalcitrant to our current conceptual tools? I keep running across phenomena that I think I recognize and I have no word for them. Or I say to people, you know, well, do you understand this and this? I'm going to describe it to you. And they say, oh, well, yes, I know what that is. So I say, what, is, what do you call it? And they say, well, um, I'm not sure. <laughs> you know? I think there are literally phenomena like that, that that we know and we recognize and we have these hunches about when we have not yet really developed a tight conceptual and theoretical approach to. So, I mean, that's one of the things that I would like to for us to be doing. At the same time, however, Zimbabwe is an interesting case. Um, I'll just go like this if I'm talking too much, right? <laughs> um, I, I was invited to a conference about Zimbabwe in June in South Africa. Um, it was all Zimbabwean except one or two of us who had studied um, places that were in, in extraordinary turbulence elsewhere. So. From my 1990s Nigeria work, I, I was invited to talk about that and how we studied it, because we, we had a, co a collective group that tried to study that as it was ongoing. And we published a book about, uh, about living under those conditions of turbulence in the mid-1990s. Military rule, structural adjustment, and so on. Um, and, um, I, was, encouraging, I was encouraging people to just do this collecting like me in the newspapers, right? Just collect up, you know, the money that, I'm sure you read this in the newspapers, the money is, is in multiples of millions, like $50 million will buy you half a loaf of bread. You know, the, the people from, the, from Zimbabwe who came to the conference gave me money. I said, you can't give it to me, I'll buy it from you. She said, nothing, you can't give me any other money that will exchange for this $50 million bill. Um, and it's dated, it only lasts for three months. It expires. So, you know, there are phenomena like that that um, we should be collecting. So I think that there's a combination of the two, collecting and thinking and talking to each other and, and really hassling. You know, I, I, I sometimes I kind of grab people. I say, look, if I describe this, just tell me if any single word or concept or theory comes to mind. You know, because I'm just trying to explore what words are people using to describe the world that they're in. So I think that those are the two for the moment that I feel that I'm very engrossed in. <coughs> so, you know, I look at this and I can't believe it. You know, it's like he's talking to me. <laughs> you, Jane Geyer, I'm telling you about the new future. <laughs> yeah. um, I was also wondering um, what you thought about uh, Naomi Klein's idea about uh, yes, the shock sure. doctrine shock and doctrine. disaster capitalism, because that has a time. Yes, it does. So, so one of the things that I was going to extrapolate a little bit further um, from this kind of punctuated time of, of us living according to dates, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, things expire and, and so on and so forth. They kick into, they kick into action and so on. Um, uh, that. Um, <coughs> I started to think that, that we think about that as somehow part of normality, that we live according to routines. Um, even, even if they're very, um, even if they're odd, they're certainly they're kind of familiar. You know, like, you know, why would somebody get however many years in jail for this, this particular infraction? 
it, you know, the, the, it, it, it starts at this date, it ends at that date. You know, it's, it, it seems sort of familiar, even if in, the, in some ways it's very odd and questionable, right? Um, so there's a certain kind of normalization to routinization, even if we, when we look, we're sort of saying, why, why are we doing, you know, why 10 years for that? No. Um, but a crisis is, uh, is, is, a, is a, an event, but an abnormal event. So it's a way of, I think, you know, it's my first instinct, is that to talk about crises as a way of staying within that frame of punctuated, dated, routinized time, but also saying that, that, um, that things happen, things happen, not because of processes, right? Because we're not talking about near future kind of processes between the short and the long run and how we fit together, right? They just happen. They're, the events that that, that emerge, um, so you have a, it's like having a dual opposition within an overall framework, right? You have you have dates and you have crises, but you're always talking about punctuated time. So it it makes it possible for people to talk about um, ab abnormality without having to engage with processes, right? They don't have to say, how did we get here? Let's just let's pull the whole thing apart. And, and, they, don't, and they don't have to uh, address it slowly and carefully, saying we've got all these different things that got woven together over several years. You know, let's just pull them all apart. And it's not that kind of thing. It's like, let's act quickly, which is her, which is her argument. So I think that it fits very, actually, quite, quite well that we call something a crisis, allows allows us to, to do that, to intervene rapidly and to contain it and say it's punctuated time, it doesn't relate to, yeah, to I mean, in my, I, cause this is a great advantage of getting old, older. <laughs> you know, because you, you get struck and you say, how do we suddenly have this language? You know, does, there are many more crises now than there ever were. <coughs> You know, people didn't talk about crisis. It didn't seem to me they talked about didn't talk much about crisis. And now we have really a lot of crises. And I think it's to do with this emergence of a punctuated approach to time. Yes. Just thinking um, because I'm I'm thinking about the law the whole time you're you're talking about this and how sort of temporality, economics, and religion map on to legal frameworks. And I, Robert Bennett uh, was here, the former Minister of Justice in France, and he was talking about the abolition of the death penalty, and very much speaking in a temporal frame, but it was very interesting, and this kind of ba piggybacks onto what you're saying, because his advice for approaching um, or, or convincing um, um, using moral suasion with the American public um, First of all, to convince them of the rightness of abolishing the death penalty, but on the other hand, saying and invoking a very distinct temporality by looking at the states in which the uh, the death penalty has actually not been used for long periods of time mm -hmm. as a way to guide policy making with respect to, and doing it one step at a time. So it's incorporating the idea of process mm -hmm. and a longer term temporality to root not to to make people look at this, you know, sort of policy issue as something that they could normalize and accept mm -hmm. as, as routine. Mm -hmm. I, I, I thought it was fascinating because he, he mentioned, you know, state, you know, I can't remember, I have to go back to my notes, state. but, you know, for, you know, 40 years, 50 years where it hasn't been, hasn't been used. So, I, you know, I'm just wondering, had you thought about the way, I mean, because you just mentioned the law, just that. Yes, right. Um, well, the, the, one, of the, one of the things that would be, um, I mean, it would be part of the same general sort of mega effort would be to understand how legal temporalities become persuasive to people. Exactly. You know, how do they get yeah. embedded in people's minds? And, and people are searching for those rhetorics in order to do precisely the same change, right. change things. I mean, how can you get traction on people's minds? What are the, how are they already thinking about time and culpability and guilt and so on? Um, in such a way that we can insert something that looks more um, promising for the future. Right? So some of, I, I sometimes think when I'm collecting these you know, headlines and sayings and so on and so forth, I, um, I think that people are, are floating balloons out there. Like, is anybody going to understand it if I say X, right? Is there going to be an answering voice if I 
try to explain this in these terms? Because I think that right at this particular moment, we don't have a very, um, we don't have a common terminology. 